Mark chapter 14, beginning in verse number 3. Well, he was in Bethany, reclining at the table in the home of a man known as Simon the leper. A woman came with an alabaster jar of very expensive perfume made of pure nard. She broke the jar and poured the perfume on his head. Some of those present were saying indignantly to one another, why this waste of perfume? It could have been sold for more than a year's wages and the money given to the poor. And they rebuked her harshly. Leave her alone, said Jesus. Why are you bothering her? She has done a beautiful thing to me. This morning I want to speak shortly on a beautiful thing. Let's set the stage for this story that we read in the book of Mark. Where are we? We're in the city of Bethany. And city is a stretch. Okay, Bethany is a suburb of Jerusalem. The Bible says that it's less than a Sabbath day walk. Well, a Sabbath day walk was three miles. So we're within three miles of the booming metropolis of Jerusalem. But we're in Bethany. We're at a place where Christ, less than several months ago, spoke into a tomb and said, Lazarus, come forth. We're in that town. And we're in the home of a man named Simon the leper. How many know that being a leper, especially in this context, is not a good thing? Historians and some scholars say that, that Simon may have actually been the father of Mary, Martha, and Lazarus. He may have been a Pharisee who contracted leprosy and was kicked out of town because lepers weren't allowed to live in the village. They had to live in the leper. We don't know who Simon is. We just know that he was a leper. The players in our story today are Simon. It was his home. We don't really know who he is, but we know that the events happened in his home. We can either, one, assume that Simon is no longer leprous, or two, he is not there. <laughs> Lepers don't host dinner parties for rock stars, okay? Jesus was the rock star, right? 30 days ago, he raised somebody from the dead. Jesus is a rock star. Lepers don't host rock stars in their homes. Apparently, though, he is a friend of Christ because Jesus is comfortable in his home. The next player is this woman. We don't know who she is. Some say it's Mary. If you read the book of John, if you read this account in the book of John, it says Mary, but it also says six days before the Passover, where our account says it was only two days away. So it could have been Mary of Bethany. John's account also mentions that she cried, she anointed his feet and wiped his feet with her hair. That's not in our account. So I want to believe that this is actually a different woman. An unnamed woman. It could be any woman. It could be any of us. The next player are some of those present. They're the nameless them. They. Those. You know what they say? Right? You know what they say? Yeah. This is, this is them. This is those nameless some. They're disciples. They're some of the townsfolk. They're just the nameless they. Some people. How many have some people? And then the last character, not to be overlooked, is this alabaster jar of perfume. The Bible tells us that it's very expensive, made of pure nard. And you're thinking, wow, what's nard? <laughs> and why does it need to be pure? Nard is actually an essential oil from the Himalayan spike nard plant. I didn't know that. I found that out on Google. Now, how far from Jerusalem are the Himalayas? 
pretty far. Thus the expense. For all you ladies that are into your essential oils. This woman was into essential oils a long time before you. She had a whole charm. Very expensive. As a matter of fact, it costs an entire year's wages for this jar. Now, for some of us, an entire year's wages really is not that expensive. But for others of us, it's a lot of money. We don't know. Another version, another version of these events say it's 300 denarii. And typically a man earned one denarius for a day's work. So it's, this represents 300 days worth of labor. How many of us have something that represents an entire year's worth of our labor? If we have that, we hold it very tight, we hold on to it very closely, and we guard it, Correct? So this alabaster jar is very special. So those are the players in our scene. But let's set the scene itself. There's a dinner table in Bethany at the time of Christ. They didn't sit up at a table. It was a low table. And they laid and they reclined on pillows and ate. So there's this table. And people are reclining around it. Probably men. This is politically incorrect in America today, but in their, in their culture, the women didn't recline at the tables with the men. They served when the men were done eating and done conversing that the women were able to eat. So let's, in our minds, consider there's probably a table with a dozen or so men reclining around it. It's probably evening. Their big meal was in the evening. Chances are the meal has already been served and the women are cleaning up, so the ladies coming in and out of the room isn't a surprise to anybody. But what's surprising is this woman who stops. Jesus is reclining by the table, and this woman stops. She kneels beside the Lord. She just broke every social glory her mama ever taught her. She reaches in a little satchel beside her. She pulls out this jar, this sealed jar, she breaks the seal, pours the contents of this jar on the Lord's head. It takes seconds for the aroma to permeate the room. When she first did it, nobody really cared. It's kind of bizarre, but Jesus was surrounded by bizarre things and bizarre people and bizarre circumstances. They were kind of used to it. But suddenly the smell of sweat and invaded their senses. And it dawned on these, some people, that this woman had just poured a year's worth salary on the head of Jesus. Where did she get this? I'm going to take a little preacher's license. We're going to experiment a little bit. We're going to think maybe of, of, of how this woman came into, came into control of this. Did it represent her future? Was it her dowry? Did she take her dowry that her daddy gave her so that she could give her husband? And did she invest in this? Was it her future? Did she buy this to hedge against inflation? We don't know. What we know is it's a lot of money. Maybe she was really wealthy. But maybe it was a sacrifice and it represented everything that she had. Let's assume for just a moment, if you would grant me that, that that alabaster jar, that little container of perfume represented everything that this woman had. And she takes it and she pours it out of the head of Christ. It's a very touching and reverent moment. 
If we were there, this morning it happened right here, we would say, oh, wow. Look at that. That's so sweet. That's so kind. But our version doesn't say that, does it? In our story, some of those present begin to indignantly say to one another, well, that's a waste. I was raised in a home where you didn't waste. Can't imagine her wasting this. It's just Jesus. The nameless they in their religious spirit say she should have sold that money and given it to the poor. Is it wrong to give money to the poor? No. Matter of fact, we're supposed to. But they did it from a pharisaical mindset, a religious mindset that said, well, we have a better idea of what she should be doing with this than her. But my friends, it wasn't there for you. That religious spirit, it says they talked amongst themselves. Hope the King of Kings and the Lord of Lords are sitting at that table. And how many know that when we whisper little religious things to each other, he hears. He wasn't craning his head to listen to the conversation. He's God Almighty. He knew what was in their hearts. As these nameless they, some people, were bashing this woman. Then, boldly, Scripture says, they scolded her. How many know that it's kind of demeaning to scold a woman? <laughs> Typically, when you use the word scold, it's a child, maybe a dog. Could be your neighbor's kid, that little brat, right? But man, if I walked up to any of you ladies and I began to scold you, there would be some hackles that were raised. Yeah. <laughs> it would not go well. Yet these men, in their religiosity, have no problem scolding this woman <laughs> for giving this gift to Christ. Now the Bible doesn't say this, but I think Jesus had a belly full of it. I think he was about, had all he could take of these religious, pharisaical people. And he doesn't give them this nice little, oh, ye of little faith. Oh, you just don't understand. You, no, what does he say? Leave her alone. Thank you, Jesus, for saying leave her alone. When those religious spirits want to come against us, we have an intercessor in heaven who says, leave them alone. Don't interfere. Why do you trouble her? She has done a beautiful thing to me. See, this lady's worship didn't look like theirs. It wasn't pomp and circumstance at the temple. It wasn't horns blowing and minstrels singing and the front page of the Jerusalem Times cheering this awesome man for having done this spectacular act of worship. This was a broken woman giving all she had. Her worship didn't look like their worship. It didn't sound like their worship. It didn't feel like their worship. But Jesus says, leave her alone. She has done a beautiful thing to me.
Then in verse 7, Jesus said, actually speak to these religious spirits. He says, the poor you will have with you always. And you can help them anytime you want. But you will not always have me. She did what she could. She poured perfume on my body beforehand to prepare for my burial. She did what she could. My question to you this morning what beautiful thing can you do to the body of God? What expensive perfume do you carry around in your alabaster jar? Let me draw a connection if you haven't gotten already. You are the alabaster jar. What perfume, what expensive thing resides in you that you can pour out on the body of Christ? Jesus' physical body isn't here, but if you look around today, you'll see the body of Christ. Each of us represents part of the body of Christ. And we each represent our own little alabaster jar just waiting to be poured out. Some may say, I have nothing to give. We've all sung the song at Christmas time about the little drummer boy. Right? I have nothing to give. Shall I play for you? What he had. What this lady had. What do you have? You see, Jesus isn't concerned about the volume. Jesus isn't concerned about the actual value of your worship. Jesus is concerned about how much of you is given into that worship. Let's go back a couple chapters into Mark chapter four, uh, chapter 12. There is no Mark chapter 4. You don't turn for it. Mark chapter 12 and verse 41. Jesus is at the temple. And it says he sat down opposite the place where the offerings were put and watched the crowd putting their money into the temple treasury. I know, I'm just going to take a little sidebar here. I know some of you don't like the idea that people know what you give. Jesus sat at the temple and watched people give their offering. Jesus is watching us give our offerings. Amen? Oof. Say amen or oof. It, it, it works on all of us. Jesus is watching. Then it says, Many rich people threw in large amounts. But a poor widow came and put in two very small copper coins worth only a fraction of a penny. Calling his disciples to him, Jesus said, Now wait a minute. If he called his disciples, his disciples were there watching too. He says, I tell you the truth, this poor widow has put more into the treasury than all the others. They gave out of their wealth, but she, out of her poverty, put in everything, all she had to live on. Out of her poverty, out of her poorness, out of her lack, she gave all. Some of us today feel like we are in poverty. We are in lack. We're poor. Jesus says, just give me. Open your hand. 
Let go of whatever the Holy Spirit is compelling you to release. It will be your act of worship, and it will be a beautiful. Jesus, you are magnificent. You are awesome. God, and we want to give you the best that we have. Lord, each of us has a treasure. Each of us has something that we can give to you. God, I pray for courage for each of us as we Open our hands and allow you to take that gift. Jesus.